Jeff Zwerink here and welcome back to Give and Take. We've got a special episode today. We're actually filming on set at the Evangelical Theological Society meeting. And I'm excited today because I have a, a friend and a colleague, Greg Davidson, and we're going to be looking at this question. Is radiocarbon dating reliable? Greg, I'm excited to have you on the show today. I know you're a department chair at the University of Mississippi. You've got a background in geology. And uh, you're even saying you had something to do with the Dead Sea Scrolls. Kind of tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, happy to. And thanks for, for having me. Uh, during my PhD work, which was in the previous millennium, uh, I was actually doing work in the University of Arizona's uh, radiocarbon lab, which was the same lab that dated the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Shroud of Turin. Uh, so it was pretty interesting work there. That's actually pretty cool. And, and you know, one of those things to me that gives validity to radiocarbon dating is that we're using that to actually establish the timing of uh, biblical artifacts. And so, so, but you know, as it is, carbon dating seems to get a bad reputation in the Christian community, or at least some segments of it. Kind of what is it, that, what is it about the dating technique? How does it work? Give us a brief overview of that. So it's dependent on C14 that's being continuously produced in the atmosphere. Okay, so carbon-14 is a different isotope than the normal carbon we deal with. Right, so carbon-12, carbon-13 are stable, they don't change. Carbon-14 has an extra neutron, right. makes it unstable, it, and it, over time it converts back to nitrogen. Okay. So we are, the plants and animals are taking up that C14 from the atmosphere all the time. Right. Uh, it's also decaying all the time. Mm -hmm. But once they die, they're no longer bringing any new C14 in, and so the clock is now ticking. And over time, that C14 level gets lower and lower and lower and lower, and so we're measuring that level, considering what the, the decay rate of carbon-14 is, and then turning that into an estimate of age. So it's, in essence, things will build up carbon-14, we're measuring how much carbon-14 there is now, you're kind of dating when they died, if you will. Yes, when that, exactly. When that thing's died. Okay. So, so the basic process seems simple. There's half-lives, and it's 5,000 some odd years. You know, there's lots of details there. But uh, what I, I'm particularly interested in was this paper that you've published that uh, looks at other ways to validate the legitimacy of the carbon radiocarbon dating. Kind of give us some background on what those other techniques that you use are. Yeah, so it's addressing the, the, the problem that, especially within the church, arguments are made against the validity of radiocarbon dating, mm -hmm. uh, with claims that assumptions are made that are not testable, uh, that it's based on things like circular reasoning and that, that lines of evidence are not independent from each other. And, but, but over the last few decades, very detailed measurements of tree rings, so the carbon-14 that's in tree rings, that going back, covering about a 14,000 year period, okay. and now very detailed records of what appears to be annual sediment layers in some lakes, particularly one in Japan, allow us to begin to combine independent data sets in ways that allow us to very rigorously test both the assumptions of conventional dating and what the, uh, particularly the young earth community will claim mm -hmm trying to, to, to say that it's not trustworthy. So, so what we've got going on there is, you know, with the tree rings, each tree grows a new ring every year, so you can actually just count those. So there's, that's a very reliable way of doing that. Uh, presumably that's going, what's going on with the sediments, is there, these varves are layers in lakes that, where you can count them yearly? That, that's the idea. And, but what the objection will be raised is that perhaps because of environmental perturbations in the past, that maybe trees put on multiple rings in okay. the Or maybe that those layers in the, in the lakes are not annual, but were the result of perturbations where we got many, many layers all at once. Okay. Perhaps during a global flood. Mm -hmm. uh, and not discounting the reality of a flood, but when we're looking at could that explain the data or invalidate carbon-14, by combining those data sets, we're actually able to test those, whether those objections are valid or not. So that, that's actually very fascinating. So you've got the carbon-14 out of the tree rings that you, you know, presumably you're sampling each tree ring and doing carbon dating on it. Yes. You're also looking at 
material in the in the lake layers, if you will, and being able to date that with carbon fourteen, and then you're able to count both of them or both the layers in the tree rings and in the lakes. And so, if you had a flood that presumably laid down a bunch of layers, what would you expect as contrasted to these layers are all in a year and carbon fourteen is reliable? What are the differences you would see there? Right. So if all of the conventional understanding of, of radiocarbon is correct, and of tree rings, and of varves, there's actually a very narrow range of expected carbon-14 levels in rings and varves as you go back in time. Okay. And if the claims of the young Earth community with everything being explained by a flood were true, we would also be able to, we would expect to see deviations from that expected range right. in very predictable ways. And what we actually find is that the, the amount of carbon-14 that's in the tree rings and the amount of carbon-14 that's in those varves lines up beautifully in that side, that ra narrow range of expected carbon-14 levels, mm -hmm. assuming that I mean, if all of the understanding of conventional science is actually right. true. Yeah, and, and there, there's a plot in your paper that I just found remarkable and very visually compelling, and uh, you know, we'll just describe it, but it's, you know, you, you plot the, the age versus carbon-14, the age versus the tree rings, the age versus ours, and they all just line up dead on back to uh, well over 10,000 years, if yeah, I remember correctly. Actually, back to about 50,000. 50,000 years. Yeah, so. which is, by the way, a common misconception about carbon-14, that, that people think that carbon-14 is being used to date the Earth age. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, carbon-14, because of its small uh, half-life, is only good to about 50,000 years right. before it, it, it's, there's too little of it left to, act, to measure accurately. Right, yeah, that makes sense. Uh, or reliably. So the, and I'll just make one correction, that the beauty of that plot is it's not dependent on an age at all, per se. Right. It's just a ring count. Mm -hmm. So looking at the amount of carbon-14 versus ring count or varve count, and if, the date, if each one of those counts represents a year, then we would expect the data to fall within that narrow range, right. and it does, and it does which yes. gives great confidence that, yes, in fact, the ring count and the varve count does equal years. You know, I just find that a very fascinating thing, and I, and I appreciate the work you've done, and I uh, just uh, appreciate the time to be here and talk with you about it today. Yeah. You know, when we look at radiocarbon dating, it, it really does get a bad reputation in the Christian community. But what's remarkable is that we can actually go out and test whether it's a reliable technique. And it turns out that it's a re very reliable technique. And so we can use it to date the Dead Sea Scrolls and Hezekiah's Tunnel and the other things that we can use to date it show that the Earth is really pretty old, but it also lines up very beautifully that this is a tool we can use to trust that the Bible gives us good things, but also that our measurements of creation are correct. You know, I would encourage you to go to reasons.org and there's an article called Multiple Lines of Evidence Support an Ancient Earth, where you can get more information about this paper and how you can use it to spread the gospel to those around you.